and expand. Uh, and what we recognize is many times the rumors are bigger than the reality. So what we're seeking to do tonight is to bring together some experts to talk about that. Uh, we really want to hold the presentations to, uh, to basics and then have time to, uh, to have questions. Let me share a couple rules here. Um, this is being uh, live on uh, Facebook Live, so we've got many people watching from across the country and probably around the world. Uh, and it's also being streamed live, uh, so it'll be picked up in many different places. When we get to the questions, we'll be putting up on the screen where you can text your questions in, uh, and then we'll bring them forward to the speakers so they can answer them. Sometimes we can combine them into to, to common questions and so on. So that's the plan. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Hart. I'm president here at Loma Linda. And we appreciate the opportunity to try to share the information that we're struggling with and trying to learn as much as we can. Uh, Dr. Adrian Cotton will be our first speaker. Dr. Cotton is one of our senior medical people here at Loma Linda that's been tracking this sort of thing and dealing with it. And then Dr. Cameron Kaiser is a public health officer at Riverside County who will give us an update from Riverside County. And Dr. Aaron Gustafson, who's the acting public health officer from San Bernardino County is here as well. So as soon as uh, Adrian and Dr. Kaiser speak, uh, we'll bring them up as a panel and we'll give you a chance to ask questions up on the screen and go from there. Uh, this is becoming a big deal. Uh, early in my career, I was in, working in Tanzania just as a smallpox epidemic. Finally, we, we got the last case. And you think about you know, eliminating the disease is one thing. We are on the front end of creating a disease. And none of us know at this point in time how big a deal this is going to be or what's going to happen. But obviously it pays us all to be aware and to track this carefully. So that's why we're all here. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Cotton to uh, present the additional material to us. Thank you, Dr. Hart. And thank you to those that uh, took the time to come today and those that are watching online. So Dr. Hart uh, was the um, catalyst before about all this about a couple weeks ago and like you said it was either going to die down or it's going to be a bigger deal and it's turned out to be a bigger deal than we thought it was going to be so this is dispelling myths what we know about coronavirus and there's a simple answer to what we know about it it's we know everything and we know nothing um, which sounds uh, very opposite of each other but it's the truth uh, it is a virus we know lots about other viruses this probably acts similar to that um, but again it's a virus that we know basically nothing about right now. We've, we've learned a lot in the last three or four weeks, and there's still a lot to learn from it. Um, so you have heard on the news that the name of this is COVID-19. That's actually the name of the disease. It stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. The actual name of the virus is SARS Coronavirus 2. You may have heard of SARS um, from a few years ago. Both SARS, MERS, and this current COVID-19 are all coronaviruses. This is what the uh, electron microscopy version of the coronavirus looks like. Um, what corona means means crown. If you look at this, if you cut it in half, it looks like the virus is actually wearing a crown. Uh, so there's multiple different kinds of coronaviruses. We've had coronavirus in the US for years. Um, there's coronavirus that goes through the community all the time. There's four main coronaviruses that we see that is very different from this one. This is, again, a novel coronavirus. It's new to this environment. The current best place to get information and updated information um, probably in the country is the CDC website. And if you want to have accurate information, uh, this is probably the best place to go. Obviously, the Internet's a rather large place. You can find a lot of information. A lot of it is inaccurate. Some of it is accurate and the CDC probably has the most accurate uh, information uh, right now. So what is the coronavirus? It's a large family of viruses that are common in many different animals, and actually it originally comes from animals. Camels, cats, uh, cattle, bats, uh, multiple animals. They're a part of our day-to-day -day lives. Like I said, there's versions of it that have been in this country for years that act nothing more than a mild, mild to moderate cold. And rarely, these animal coronaviruses will flip into a human host, and that's when we see MERS, SARS, and now COVID-19. So this is kind of the current COVID-19 timeline for those that haven't seen it yet. So December 31st of 2019, this was identified in Wuhan City, Hubei Province in China. 
January 11 of this year was the first confirmed death from the virus. January 20 was the first confirmed case in the United States. January 30, the World Health Organization declared this uh, outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. January 31, Health and Human Services in the United States declared this a public health emergency. February 2 was the first death outside of China. February 5, hundreds of people evacuated from Hubei province. Um, how that's relevant to us, a lot of those came to March Air Reserve Base in Riverside County, and Dr. Kaiser will talk about that shortly. February 10, the death toll in China surpassed the number of the first SARS virus. Uh, February 25, that's today, CDC says Americans should brace for the likelihood that the coronavirus will spread to U.S. communities. So it is a beta coronavirus. We think it actually originated from bats. The, pat, the, uh, the coronavirus that's been identified here in the U.S. and sequenced looks very similar to the uh, original one that was posted in China, suggesting that this coronavirus that's out there came from a single source and has then spread since then. Early on, most of this, again, was in Wuhan, China, um, and it was linked to people that had been to a seafood and live animal market. Uh, and that's where we thought this was the first part of the animal to person spread. After that, uh, it seemed to start to again spread through the community, and that's when we first noticed that this was person to person spread. We do think it actually is droplet spread, so it's more like influenza than airborne spread, which is like the measles. Measles is a much more contagious virus than COVID 19. Um, so the symptoms, uh, symptoms, have, again, if you've watched the news recently, they can range from no symptoms at all to being very severely ill and dying. However, the majority of people will have mild to moderate disease, um, which is probably going to be a low-grade fever, a little bit of cough, runny nose, a little bit of shortness of breath. So these are the most common symptoms that patients have presented with. And currently, our belief is that these symptoms can appear in about two days after exposure up to about 14 days. Again, you'll have heard other information online and on the news. Again, what do we know about the coronavirus? Everything and nothing. This is the most likely um, incubation period for this virus because, again, it's probably very similar to other known viruses. The severity, again, it can be very mild um, or can be very severe. Generally, the, severe peop the people that die from it or the people that get the severe illness are older or have medically fragile conditions major lung disease, diabetes, or other genetic diseases they're born with. The case fatality rate, so the number of people that get this illness and then die from it, so these are the current estimates. So the original SARS virus, about 9.6% of people that were exposed to it passed away from it. The MERS, it's about 34.4%, and the current COVID-19, it's running in the 2.3% um, for our entire group. However, if you're over 80, 14.8% of people that will get COVID will pass away from it. If you're 70 to 79, about 8% of people um, currently that have been exposed will pass away from it. So the key to this slide here is the first word is potential. And potential should probably be made as large as possible. So the potential public threat, health threat is high, both globally uh, and here in the United States. However, the individual risk and the risk currently in the Riverside and San Bernardino counties is low. So the individual risk is dependent on exposure. So if I have COVID-19 and walk through this room and walk out this door, the chances of anyone in this room getting COVID-19 is almost zero. You can't say zero, but it's almost zero. If I have COVID-19 and I'm sick and we spend three or four hours in a very small room together talking and having conversation, then there's actually a slight chance that you will get the disease. The estimates are for every person that gets the disease, they pass it on to 2.8 other people. So again, the potential risk is high, the actual risk is low, um, currently in the United States. There's a couple words I'd like to define in here because you'll see these words again all over the media and all over the press and all over the different websites is epidemic and pandemic. So epidemic is an outbreak of a disease that attacks many people at about the same time and may spread through one or more communities. COVID-19 could be considered an epidemic in certain areas. It is not an epidemic here. Pandemic is when the epidemic spreads across a whole country or the world. COVID-19 is not a pandemic yet. Here, around the world, or actually anywhere in the world, including China, it is not officially a pandemic yet. So how does it spread? So it's most often spread from person to person. 
happens in close contacts, so usually you've got to be within six feet, six feet of each other, and it's mainly via respiratory droplets when you cough, sneeze, etc. So probably, it says it's currently unclear if a person can get it from touching a surface, but the most likely way you're getting it is if I have COVID-19, I will rub my nose, I will grab this door handle, and I will walk out. You will grab the door handle to walk out, you will rub your nose, and you will get COVID-19 that way, which is very similar to how you get influenza and other com current common viral infections. So for prevention, there's currently no vaccine to prevent the COVID-19 infection. There's actually 12 vaccines being developed right now. There are two that have been approved to actually um, start to be produced, one of them in Australia and one of them uh, it combined GlaxoSmithKline and uh, one of the companies out of China working on it. Now, those are not available yet. We don't know when they'll be available or if they'll be available. However, even if there is a vaccine to prevent COVID-19, um, this is probably not what's going to stop the disease in its tracks. We have, a, we have a vaccine for influenza that works reasonably well that people don't use. Um, and I would strongly recommend getting the influenza vaccine before I would get a COVID-19 vaccine. So again, the CDC still recommends avoiding close contact with people who are sick, avoid touching your eyes, wash your hands plenty. Um, you can use alcohol-based hand sanitizers as well. We think those work as well. Stay home when you're sick. Uh, feel free to use tissues, sneeze into your elbow, all the things you tell your 12-year-old kids to do. So if you feel sick, um, and if you're worried that you might have COVID-19, unless you've been in China or in close contact with someone with China that had been in China in the last 14 days, you probably don't need to worry about it. But if you do want to see somebody, we would suggest that you call your doctor's office prior to getting there or call the hospital that you want to go to prior to getting there. And then when you arrive, what we would like is you to wear a mask or something like that when you first get there. And again, try and avoid as much contact as you can with other people. So clean and disinfect, disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. Wash your hands frequently. Soap and water, again, alcohol-based um, hand sanitizer. Although ideally, it should be at least 60% alcohol. Um, so how do you test for this? So the CDC developed a PCR test that can, um, can relatively quickly, either from a respiratory sample or a blood sample, tell whether or not you have um, COVID-19. Uh, January 24, they posted this uh, publicly so other people could work on developing tests as well. So right now, this testing has to occur at the CDC. So if Dr. Hart has visited China and comes to visit me in clinic and I suspect that he has COVID-19, I actually then have to call Dr. Gustafson from San Bernardino County Health Department, tell her the story. She then gets to make a decision on whether or not Dr. Hart should be tested. If she says yes, we do the testing. We then have to send the sample over to the CDC. That usually takes overnight. It then takes about 24 to 36 hours for them to get the results uh, and then send it back to us. In that time, we have to decide what we're going to do with Dr. Hart. So again, Dr. Gustafson helps let us know what we get to do with him. If he's not sick, we, we probably send him home. If he's sick, he probably ends up in the hospital in an isolation room. As of today, California is still not running the test. Uh, again, it has to go to the CDC. We are hoping that this is going to be available in the local county health departments soon, but it's not yet. So a few myths and facts. So how does the virus spread? Um, again, it's spread person to person, respiratory droplets. Um, and there's currently no evidence that it, the virus is airborne. There's been a question as to whether or not uh, it can spread through fecal oral contact or fecal route. The answer is we don't think so as of right now. The next question is, is there a treatment? The answer is no, um, but there are some signs of progress. There's a couple patients in uh, Thailand that doctors think they have treated successfully with it. We think this is probably more random dumb luck than anything else. Um, because again, there are no antiviral medications that we know that treat this virus. Um, the, so the current treatment is supportive care. If you come in in respiratory failure and you can't breathe, we put you on a ventilator, hoping that you get through the illness. So it's all supportive care. There is no treatment yet for COVID-19. So who's at risk? everybody's at risk for getting it. Although again, the risk is low. The risk increases with age 
And with certain medical conditions, asthma, COPD, um, or if you're, quotes, if you're considered a med medically fragile patient, then you have a higher risk of getting COVID-19 than others. How do you protect yourself? Again, we've talked about this multiple times. Stay away from people, wash your hands as much as you can, cover your nose and mouth, try to avoid large gatherings. This says wear a face mask. That is actually not current recommendations by either the CDC or the, county, uh, the California Department of Public Health. We do not suggest that you wear a face mask um, when you're out um, visiting people. So is it safe to travel? And we'll put the, the current CDC travel guidance uh, up on the next screen. Um, so airlines have suspended lots of flights. Uh, thousands of foreign citizens have been evacuated back to their home countries, not just the United States. And the United States and others have currently advised travel, advised against traveling to China. So as of this morning, the official CDC travel guidance is level three. So China and South Korea both meet this level, which means avoid non-essential travel. Um, so unless you have to go there for a very specific reason, probably shouldn't travel to China or South Korea. Level two, which is the practice enhanced precautions, which basically means older adults and medically fragile people should consider postponing non-essential trips. Uh, that is Japan, Iran, and Italy. Um, there's been a, you've probably seen there's been a kind of a little bit of an outbreak in Italy over the last couple of days. Level one, so kind of usual precautions is Hong Kong. And then four countries that have, seem to have a little bit more spread of the disease than others, but no current travel warnings is Singapore, Thailand, Taiwan, and Vietnam. You've also seen on the news and other places about cruise ships being stuck on a cruise ship, being isolated on a cruise ship, and then getting transported back here to the US. So the current recommendations are if you have a cruise ship voyage to or within Asia, you should probably think about canceling it and rescheduling it for the future. So COVID-19 in the US, now these numbers will seem shockingly low to you, and they actually are quite low. So the key on this one is this statement right here. This does not include people who return to the US via State Department chartered flights. So if you were brought back in one of those, you don't count in these numbers. Other than that, there's been 14 confirmed cases in the United States. Um, so it's really not that many. Um, and cases, um, again, these are people that have been repatriated, three from Wuhan and 36 from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. This is what COVID-19 looks like globally as of yesterday. Uh, this is the last uh, map available from the World Health Organization. And the size of the dots is the number of confirmed cases in those areas. Now, what you have to remember with the number of cases in China, China actually def changed the definition of, of a positive case for coronavirus about a week and uh, probably a week to 10 days ago. So it used to be that you had to be culture positive with the symptoms. Again, about 10 days ago, they changed the diagnosis to you didn't have to be culture positive. So if you think of all the number of people that could have these symptoms, fever, cough, uh, shortness of breath, the number then goes up dramatically. Do we know if it's coronavirus or not? We don't. Uh, but that's where you see the big jump in the, quotes confirmed cases of coronavirus in China. This is the World Health Organization data, again, as of last night. There's... And the, the numbers in parentheses are the number of, quotes new cases in the last 24 hours and the number of cases globally. So 79,000 confirmed globally, 77,000 of those confirmed in China, uh, 2,600 deaths in China, 23 deaths outside of China. This is confirmed numbers as of yesterday. So with that, what do we have to worry about here in Riverside and San Bernardino counties? So the beast that we have to remember is actually influenza. So when you look at those numbers on the previous slide, which has 23 deaths outside of China, and you look at this, so this is the CDC estimates of influenza in the United States from October 1 through February 15, we've had between 16 and 41,000 flu deaths this year. Again, these are all estimates, um, but those numbers are significantly higher than the coronavirus. So yes, we still need to remember about influenza as being kind of a bigger public health issue at this point in time. So what is Loma Linda University Health's responsibilities? Um, so we need to help decrease some of the, quotes mass hysteria that's going on about this illness um, by giving accurate information to our staff, patients, media. Uh, so education is vitally important. We also need to help protect our students, our patients, 
our employees, our faculty, and other staff um, from exposure and recurrent exposure to something like this. We need to screen patients at the entry points to Loma University Health for potential risk exposure. So if you've actually received health care here in the last two weeks, you will have been asked the question, have you traveled to China? If you answer no, um, then you get asked if you've been exposed to someone that's been traveled to China. If you answer no to that, the questions stop. If you answer yes to either one of those questions, you get a couple more questions. Um, then we need to evaluate patients that are high risk of being exposed. And then in combination with our county health departments, Dr. Gustafson and Dr. Kaiser, have conversations with them about what we should do and the next steps for those patients. And then if patient is diagnosed, is the treatment, and it's actually more the care of them rather than the treatment, because there is no actual treatment other than supportive treatment. That's my first part, and Dr. Kaiser. Thank you, Adrian, and come on up, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, I'm trying not to cough, Adrian, so I... <laughs> Dr. Kaiser has had his hands full over the last few weeks. Uh, I think many of you saw the report where the uh, airline landed at March Reserve Base and uh, discharged some people there from Wuhan. Uh, and so we've asked him to come and kind of update on what all's happening in that arena and uh, carry us from there. And then we'll put together the panel for some questions. Great. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is, as Dr. Hart said, I am the public health officer for the County of Riverside. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and pontificate because those of you uh, who know me know that if there's one thing I can do, it is pontificate. Um, so we'll sort of get right to it. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about, I don't have any slides because I don't do death by PowerPoint. Um, COVID, I, I want to talk actually primarily about our quarantine experience. Not only from the perspective of that I think it's interesting um, and the story I think is noteworthy, um, but also that it gives you sort of insight into how public health departments do what we do and some of the many functions that we are engaged in to help protect our population. Um, and COVID-19 is particularly noteworthy for being the first infectious agent to trigger a federal quarantine in over 50 years. Quarantine actually comes from the Italian for 40 days. It was first recorded in Venice um, in the 14th century where ships that were possibly infected were required to sit at anchor for, you guessed it, 40 days um, before they could land. But other than a patchwork of various local and state laws, federal quarantine really wasn't a thing in the United States until about 1878, um, when it was actually first used for yellow fever. By 1921, the quarantine system had been fully nationalized, was operated by the commissioned officers of the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, who in various capacities still do that today for the other federal agencies. Um, and such officers do today, of course, under the auspices of the CDC since 1967. Uh, the CDC quarantine network covers 18 stations at major ports of entry, both in airports and sea crossings, and is operated through the CDC Division of Global Migration Quarantine, or DGMQ. At international points of entry, the CDC is authorized by federal law to detain and medically examine people who may be suspected of having a communicable disease. Um, this list is actually relatively brief of what they can cover. It has things like cholera, um, diphtheria, TB, plague, smallpox, yellow fever, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers such as Ebola and Marburg were on that list. And then most relevant to us was severe acute respiratory syndromes, which was added in 2003 to respond to SARS. Um, the CDC gets this information through a lot of different sources. They receive it sometimes directly from the vessels themselves, from pilots, uh, from captains of cruise ships, routine monitoring of entrance, and of course reports from other countries. For other situations or diseases that are not on that list, then the various state and tribal authorities get involved. Um, in California, every county has an individual who is legally empowered to issue orders of quarantine and isolation, um, and by law, that is a county health officer. In Riverside County, that's me. In San Bernardino, uh, Dr. Gustafson is currently filling that role. We can serve these orders on the spot if necessary. We don't have to get a judge to sign off on them. There is still due process involved. They still get their day in court. If it's an airborne disease, court may be out in the parking lot. Um, but nevertheless, those people still get it judicially examined. Now, the last federal quarantine in the United States was imposed for a 1963 outbreak of smallpox. To my knowledge, there has never been one actually under the auspices of the CDC itself. Because remember, in 1963, it was still the USPHS that was doing it directly. 
And these repatriation flights, as Dr. Cotton briefly mentioned, these are done under the auspices of the State Department. And most of this first group were State Department employees. A few of them were private citizens. And as most folks here know, the original destination of those planes was going to be Ontario International Airport. Um, I won't talk much about those preparations. Dr. Gustafson knows a lot more about that than I would, except to say that by all accounts, what they were working on was extensive. Um, we did not find out until the day before, on January 28th, that that plane was being redirected to March Air Force Base, giving us uh, about 12 to 18 hours to stand up a response. Um, they had had their intermediate medical screening in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, now they were coming to us. CDC was going to be on the ground. We would be there as well. And also the Administration for Children and Families from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, who was directly responsible for their welfare. When you deal with the quarantine, there are two main priorities. And the first one is medical continuity. Um, we need to make sure that if somebody gets sick, they've got a place to go. The whole reason they're in quarantine is because we're worried somebody might get sick. That place is not going to be the quarantine zone. Um, in most concepts, this would ideally be some sort of separate area, um, an isolation area at a hospital if they have a severe enough acute disease. Um, but keep in mind that also has an impact on the hospital uh, because you're taking up a bed and you're freaking people out. Um, as our PIO will say, things leak. Um, and we dealt with this problem in two ways. First of all, there was an ambulance on 24-hour call, making sure that if somebody was identified, we got them out of there fast. Secondly, we had actually our health system mobile clinic on the premises, staffed by a lead physician in nursing. Um, we didn't have a lot of radiology services. We mostly just had ultrasound. But we did have lab. We did have some pharmacy services. And this allowed it to essentially run at the level of an advanced urgent care. Um, and this was important because we didn't want to make any patient transfers out of the quarantine zone that we didn't have to. Uh, and in fact, we were able to handle higher acuity patients than a typical disaster medical team might be able to. In fact, we did so several times, things like shunt malfunctions and stuff like that. So even though this was quite expensive to run, it probably did pay off. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the second and biggest concern that you have with the quarantine is security. Um, it needs to be a facility where you can lock doors if needed, observe what's going on, that you can actually enforce a perimeter. Um, no one's in jail here, but we are restricting your movement. That is a deprivation of liberty that has civil rights overtones, and it is one that's necessary in this situation, but if we're going to enforce it, we need to do so consistently and make sure that it is grounded in legal thought. Uh, we also need to make sure their daily needs are accounted for. We are not allowing them to leave. So that means we need to make sure that food is dealt with, shelter is dealt with, things that they would require for their normal activities of daily living. The facility that we used on March Air Reserve Base was actually their hotel. Yes, the Air Force runs hotels. Did you know that? Um, they have a whole network of them. They call them the Air Force Inns. I am an Air Force brat, and I didn't know that. Um, we used actually two wings of the March Inn. That gave them comfortable rooms with privacy, at least crummy Motel 6 quality, at least that high. Um, uh, the courtyard and, and part of the parking lot we use are actually very nice rooms. I'm, I'm being a little unfair here. Um, Jose even sent out a few pictures on the uh, official Twitter account. And if you don't follow it, that's Rivco, uh, Rivco Doc on Twitter, R-I-V-C-O, D-O-C, tell your friends. Um, a courtyard and part of the parking lot that gave a gathering area that they could be around. Common areas were used for symptom screens to take blood and nasopharyngeal samples, which we sent off. And since everyone had a room key, we knew where everyone was going to be. Um, we also had behavioral health on scene. We found it was actually useful to station them at the commissary uh, because everybody had to go through there at least once to pick up stuff and, and uh, get their basic supplies. So the real trick was the perimeter itself because remember, we got the first plane before there was a federal quarantine. Now, the federal quarantine wasn't instituted until several days later. I'll mention that first. So we actually had to deal with a, a perimeter with not actually having a clear order about what to do. The base had their security forces to keep the media and the public out at large, but they could not enforce the actual perimeter for us. This was because the Department of Defense said they were to have no dealings with the evacuees directly. This actually makes good sense. Um, even though March Air Reserve Base has reserve in its name, this is an operational base. They have mission readiness. They have stuff they need to do. Uh, and no one wanted any possibility that the base's mission readiness would be affected any more than it was already being. Uh, so security then became the CDC's problem. And the word had come down from the Department of State that people were to get with the program or else. Uh, but remember, not everybody on that plane was a State Department employee. Such was the state of affairs, and the plan landed around 8, 10 a.m. on January 29th. Now recall, 
this flight was coming from the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, Hubei province, where today's count is some 64,000 of the over 80,000 worldwide cases. There is an app for that. Um, the uh, Johns Hopkins University actually has a daily one. It's kind of in my bookmarks right now. Uh, we're showing over 80,000 for today. And the original idea, which was put forward at the con press conference, was that people would get tested if they'd like to. Uh, and if they were negative in some sort of turnaround time elapsed, then they would go home and their health departments would do active monitoring. When we talk about active monitoring, that means we're calling them up on the phone, we're making sure where they are, we're making sure we get some sort of temperature. Um, and you know, we may be doing this for a large number of people. We did it for Ebola, for example. But without going into great detail, a scheme like that rapidly became untenable. Because the biggest reason is these folks can't plan. Most of them weren't from, um, none of them were from Riverside County. Many of them were not from California. So how do they know when they're done? When do the tests come back? How do I get a plane flight home? Where do I go? Um, it was actually a very long first night for me personally um, because I had to use my own authority to take care of a few problems that the marshals, because there was no federal directive, were not able to do themselves. On January 31st, though, DGMQ came down with the order that there would be a mandatory 14-day quarantine that would be imposed. The plane had left Wuhan on Feb January 28th Pacific time. That started their clock because they're no longer in country. That meant they were done by February 11th. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about incubation time because that has come up quite a bit in the media. Dr. Cotton talked about this briefly, um, but let's go into a little bit more detail. As has been mentioned, COVID-19 is a lot like SARS. Um, about 70% of its genome is in common to the point where it's actually called SARS-CoV-2. SARS had an incubation period of up to 14 days, generally less than 10, so people picked 14 as an upper bound. Um, coronaviruses, as Dr. Cotton also pointed out, are not new things to medical science. Um, they are as one of the ubiquitous causes of the common cold. Odds are everybody in this room has dealt with a coronavirus of some type at least once in their lives. And lots of people have heard these Chinese reports of extreme outliers beyond the 14-day mark. Um, one of the most notable was a 72-year-old gentleman from Wuhan who apparently had an incubation period of 27 days. The problem with these reports, besides the fact they're not peer-reviewed to my knowledge, is that they don't account for a phenomenon called multiple exposure. Let's say Dr. Cotton here has been exposed. Okay? Now, he's in San Bernardino County right now. He is now Dr. Gustafson's problem. Um, but we don't know how much he actually got exposed to. There is no such thing as a viral disease out there where a single viral particle will get you sick, even under experimental conditions. Let, uh, the flu, which is contagious as it is, has an infectious dose of somewhere between seven and 800 viral particles, depending on the strain and the susceptibility of the host. So let's say that you're also somewhere where there's a lot of virus in the air, 20, you know, a lot of droplets hanging around. 27 days later, you get sick. How do you know that you were not exposed somewhere in between? What if that real exposure on day zero, right out here, was not enough to get you sick enough 27 days later, and the actual exposure that you had was somewhere in there? In fact, the risk of multiple exposure goes up with the epidemiologic measure of prevalence. If the disease is more common, you are more likely to be exposed to it multiple times. This case from Wuhan was right from the epicenter. The dragon is literally flying in the air. This guy probably got hit with it multiple times in there. Um, and this is, you gotta weigh this with the fact that I am depriving these people of liberty for the whole two weeks that they're there. And I can't go up to them and say, gee, you know, I don't know. Um, we got these reports and they're saying it should be uh, 20 days or maybe 27 days. So I'm gonna lock you up for a couple more weeks. How would you like if that was one of you? If I'm going to lock you up longer, I have to have a very good reason. Um, and these reports so far aren't it. And they go against everything that we know about this virus and its relatives. Um, and as Dr. Cotton eloquently said, which is everything and nothing, um, which is why neither the WHO and the CDC have made any changes, and I'm pretty cool with it also. I would be more interested in an outlier case from one of these countries which are, the prevalence isn't so high. For example, if I hear something like this out of Italy, then I start getting a little more worried. Um, but as far as what we're seeing here, you know, where I'm keeping an eye on the situation in China, but so far I'm pretty satisfied with that 14 days, and that was the number we went with. So, in the meantime, we got a directive. The marshals have an order they can enforce. We set up fencing that was high enough to remind people they were in quarantine, not so high enough that we were building Alcatraz in Moreno Valley. 
Um, and we had ingress and egress points at, at points of entry so that people were properly getting in and out of their personal protective equipment. Um, the marshals made people sign in and out. You had to have a green wristband. In fact, if I'd thought of it, I would have worn mine to be in the queue zone. And I also put out a directive that county staff had to be in appropriate equipment as well. We did not want to be caught in the dragnet if somebody ended up being positive. Even though this was the CDC's ops, county staff was still doing a lot of the work. In the meantime, um, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in HHS came in with their incident management team, and they set up what we called Unified Command. Um, for those of you who have ever done an emergency response, you may have heard something called the Incident Command System, where you basically have a command structure set up, and you have your four branches under it, and you brainstorm what you're going to do during a particular period. Uh, we had unified command between us, our county emergency management department, county sheriff, CDC, ACF, the State Department, all the major players, so that we had a flow of operations and a common operational picture. That is the standard for a large operation like this, so that it's absolutely essential if we have something go wrong that people aren't running off doing their own thing. And we did have two scares during the quarantine period. Um, now, both of these were young children. I am a family practitioner by training. Find me a kid who is not running a fever at some point during the winter. Um, but because these were kids from Hubei province, we had to take that seriously. Uh, so they, we can't stay on base. The base doesn't want them to be there. Um, we got them swabbed again, and they went to the hospital and waited out their time until CDC could deliver the results. Again, having EMS on premises was key. Everybody was in personal protective equipment from there and back. We got them to a direct, directly admitted to a, hotel, to a hospital room. Didn't have to worry about messing up the ED, made sure that they were in and out of there appropriately, had good connection between me as a public health authority and those people out there, and we handled that relatively well. But even though these people tested negative, still people found out. And you would think that I had turned Riverside University Health System Medical Center into a biological weapons dump, the way that people reacted to that. No, seriously. We had people cancel surgeries. We had people canceling their OB deliveries because they thought that was going on. Wait till they find out we have TB patients there too. <laughs> and actually that brings me to the end of the story. We did try to keep life as normal as possible for these people. They had a Super Bowl party. Um, there was Tai Chi and Zumba and we had kids on scooters. Uh, somebody was doing chalk art actually out in the courtyard. Um, we had town halls. A lot of uh, people uh, made new friends there. They promised to all keep in touch after it. I hear they're actually going to do a reunion. Um, no, seriously, they are, because you know what? What, what, an, what a shared experience, right? And when February 11th rolled around, it was like graduation. Everybody had tested negative, sometimes multiple times. Um, nobody had gotten sick. You saw that famous picture, and Jose asked to get the credit for this picture. You know, he treated it out under my name, but that picture of them throwing the masks in the air, we didn't tell them to do that. They came up with it themselves. That was their graduation ceremony. And yet, there was a lot of ugliness. Uh, in the community, on social media, had some really nasty comments. Some base personnel even got actually accosted in uniform um, to the point where uh, base administration was so concerned they told them to come in civilian clothes and change on base. There was one of the civilian staff who said her neighbor wouldn't, uh, who used to bring her fruit would not go by her house anymore. Um, number one, this isn't even justified. These people turned out to be completely negative. But number two, it doesn't square with anything that we know about the illness. It's unjustified and it's unacceptable. Um, and we made it very clear through our public messaging that these people don't have the coronavirus. They went home. Um, yes, we know where they went. We have that list. No, one, no cases have popped up in those people's communities, which actually goes a great deal to reassuring us that that 14-day period was correct. Um, we kept their identities confidential. Some did publicly out themselves. Um, many people were understanding of what went on and the knowledge that these people had to go home, but a few were not. And for the remaining quarantine areas in the United States, this is still a problem. After this main group left, we had some onesie twosies who were travelers from LAX. Uh, they had various different quarantine dates. They completed theirs uneventfully and left after 14 days. On the 22nd, the mission was mentioned to be complete. The rooms were cleaned to hospital grade, um, more than would even be required because think of how many disgusting things happen in hotel rooms anyway. And then they were returned to usual operation. Um, so what's the moral of the story? Well, um, I personally learned it's really hard to do a press conference with laryngitis. Um, it turns out this is surprisingly difficult. But it is also the learning experience of having been involved in a public health response that potentially had real consequences. Uh, we were lucky. None of our group got sick. These later flights have not gone nearly as smoothly. And even though there were probably some opportunities for improvement, some of it is just plain bad luck. 
Um, they got folks who were actually incubating something. We didn't. Uh, we could have, though, and we were brainstorming out these pieces and learning from our colleagues about how to deal with this if we have to confront the situation again, and to make sure that we have an appropriate plan for dealing with coronavirus in our own community. Uh, Riverside County, for example, today we announced that we have our first case. Fortunately, that case is not physically in Riverside County. Um, that case happens to be one of the cruise ship returners there in a Northern California facility. We're working with public health authorities in that area, so fortunately we don't have a local exposure that we're aware of. We're going to chase down the details, make sure we know where they are, make sure we can account for all their movements. That's what we do. Um, this first one, though, we were lucky on. If somebody happens to get through that dragnet, then we need also to be aware um, that we're going to have to do some work in the community, figure out what people's risks are. Um, if necessary, then the legal powers of the health officer may come to bear to make sure that we're keeping all of you safe. Um, if it turns out that we are called upon again, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Um, we spent close to a million and a half dollars in county money uh, to actually run this response. Much of it was staffing, um, but a fair bit of it was equipment. Because uh, remember, the IMT wasn't in there for a few days. The CDC was having supply chain problems, so we actually provided a lot of that equipment. It was our lab that did the, uh, the specimen testing, made sure that these things were sent off to Atlanta, because the CDC is still the only game in town to make sure that we have appropriate testing. Now, do not misunderstand me. We were proud to serve. We will do it again if we are asked to do so. But this is still an impact on the base and the county, which has yet to be covered. On the whole, though, um, this was an experience that few of us in public health will ever have in our careers again. It was an amazing opportunity to work with all the dedicated people from the CDC, uh, the Public Health Service, ACF, and, and ASPR. And we really also want to thank the base for what they put up with during this, especially from General Coburn, the base commander on down. They were great people. We are proud to have carried out the first federal quarantine in over 50 years. Um, I just hope that this whole thing is over very soon, or it may have been for naught. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Hart. Thank you, uh, Cameron. Come on up. Uh, Dr. Aaron Gesterson, the public health acting public health officer for San Bernardino County, and uh, Dr. Cotton. Uh, so let's start. Uh, this is how you can text in some questions, and we'll have a team that are reviewing these and combining some that are similar and uh, start dealing with some questions. Um, let me start with the first one. Adrian, you've got a big tent out in your emergency room parking lot. Do you want to tell us about that? Sure. The tent has been a media darling for the last couple of years here. We put the tent up actually every uh, winter. It's our, quotes influenza tent, but it's actually our overflow tent for when we get too full in the main, uh, the main ER. We've actually used it once, quotes, for coronavirus this year. Uh, there was a family that was sent to us from, uh, actually from Corona. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you can bet that city really loves that name. Yep. And uh, we did testing on one of the uh, individuals, and uh, I believe Dr. Gustafson actually let us let those that let that family go home. They did test negative. Um, so it's, it's actually mainly used as an overflow tent uh, when the main ER gets too full. And really set up for flu, not for coronavirus at all. So correct. Although we did we did modify. It, um, once this came out, we actually put in uh, a better HEPA filtration air system, and we actually could isolate two different patients in there if we needed to. Okay. Okay. Do we have some questions starting to come in? I don't even know who's talking to me here. We're up here, Dr. Hart. Uh, so our first, our first question actually came in from Marilee on Facebook, and she asked, how long can the COVID-19 virus remain virulent on surfaces? I'll go, I'll go ahead and feel that one. The answer is, even though we don't know for certain, we don't have exact numbers on that, the answer is believed to be not very long. Um, there are viruses which are exceptionally well armored. Hepatitis A would be the classic example. That one can survive on surfaces for hours to days. For, for other coronaviruses, you're probably looking at on the order of minutes to hours. Um, it dries out. It's damaged by ultraviolet light. Um, simple cleaning will destroy it. Um, so even though it can be there for a period of time, we don't believe it's going to be a substantial period of time. It's not like something where you sneeze onto a towel and two days later somebody gets sick. Uh, we don't believe it works that way at all. Okay. Another one. Why is it not recommended to wear a mask if it's transferable like the regular flu? And that's also from Facebook. Keep the particles moving out. It's not 
as much to protect the people who breathing in the particles. So when I walk through airports, as I do some places, I stand now in Hong Kong, everybody's got a mask on. Right. No point. Right. Okay. Another question. Are any of the panelists doing anything personally to prepare for this to hit the U.S.? Well, I'm trying to get a lot more sleep. <laughs> um, that probably helps. Um, you know, as what yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it from Riverside County's perspective, and, and Dr. Gustafson can go from San Bernardino's. Um, from our particular one, we're trying to make sure number one that we have the appropriate structures in place where if we do get a case, we can push it through the system quickly, uh, figure out where they are. As I said, there are certain legal powers which can be brought to bear. If I think that there's an urgency about that, we may utilize those. If we have large numbers, we need to talk about uh, where we're going to put them. Uh, I don't want to overwhelm a hospital with, with these cases, especially because hopefully many of them will have relatively minor disease and would have been in the hospital anyway. That being said, I don't really want them out in the community at large either, at least until I can prove that they are no longer a communicability risk. Um, this is why, for example, there's that situation in Costa Mesa where they're trying to figure out whether people can go there safely. I want to make sure that one thing is clear, and I'm not going to talk specifically about the Costa Mesa situation because that's not my jurisdiction. But I do want to answer to the question because this popped up with people in Morona Valley. The fact that you've got people there who may have coronavirus, the risk to the community, even of those people actually being present, is zero. And the reason why it's zero is for the things that Dr. Cotton has already said. This is not something where the virus is wafting through the air. Primarily, it's spread by droplet nuclei. And even if a few of them did get around, they're not going to last very long. The air is dry. There's ultraviolet light from the sun. It's getting mixed with every other uh, amount of air that's out there, the, you know, the literal almost infinite volumes of air that exist between them. You know, we were standing out at, at the March Air Museum, which is probably you know, half a mile or so, from where these people were. We're not wearing masks. We don't have to wear masks. Every uh, negative pressure system in the world ventilates to the outside air. The solution to pollution is dilution. That's a, ma that's a maxim in medical <laughs> school, right? Um, so I want people to realize, when, when we're talking about actually having people housed there, I'm not particularly worried about your risk until I'm within a few feet of those people. I didn't wear a mask when I was sitting there on base, and I'm 30 feet from where the quarantine line is. When I walked into that Q zone, I certainly did because I can't predict who's going to come up next to me and, and be concerned from that standpoint. But just because these things are there, and we may have to talk about that in the future in one of our communities, just because they are there does not in and of themselves represent a threat to the community. These people are still under a federal quarantine that is still enforceable by federal officers. If it's not enforceable by them, it's enforceable by me. Uh, and we want to do everything in our power to make sure that our communities remain safe. I live here, too, and I don't want to be a risk to myself, let alone the rest of you. Speaking of masks, we had uh, <clears throat> related to a number of hospitals in China and immediately started getting requests to buy as many masks as we could and send over there. By the time that came, probably a week into this, the whole U.S. mask supply was spoken of. You couldn't get masks. Yeah, I can't uh, paint my fence, you guys. Stop it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Okay, another question, uh, Kelsey. Can you comment on today's warning by the CDC? Um, no. <laughs> you know, I, planners got a plan. Um, if, if the CDC did not have a plan to deal with this, we should all be very frightened. Um, and the fact that they actually are doing this and trying to get people to understand. I think our, our best guidance here would be pandemic flu um, because some of the same infection control principles apply, as Dr. Cotton so eloquently said. Um, and even though this kind of stuff, I mean, you know, the word pandemic is with P, but so does the word panic. Um, and I don't want people to panic, but I also want people to be prepared, okay? So there's another P word for you. Um, and then at least that way people understand what's going to happen. You know, the worst thing that can occur in this is we get a whole bunch of cases and nobody knows what to do about it. Uh, and making sure that people are prepared, that you know what's actually going to occur, this enables us to actually deal with it. I hope we don't get to that point. But the fact that a plan does exist, is something that I think should give us a little more hope that we can properly, uh, possibly deal with the situation better than, unfortunately, the People's Republic of China apparently has. Let me ask this to any of you. I heard on the news this morning that the federal government has asked for $2.5 billion to control this. How will they spend that money? Not on me. <laughs> build a wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, build a wall. I mean, what uh, well, I... Well, Dr. Gustafson needs a new car. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, what will they actually spend the money on? I suppose public messaging, uh, whatever? There's going to be that. I imagine also some of that money will go to the response teams um, because it does cost a certain amount. Reimburse Riverside a million dollars? for. Uh, we certainly hope so. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I say, we're proud to serve either way. Yeah. Okay, more questions, Kelsey. As a parent, what threshold should I look for in my family? Temperature, cough, or a combination of symptoms? Adrian? So I think it's all three of those. Um, but again, the, the key is the exposure risk. So just because you have a temperature, a cough, or you're short of breath doesn't mean you should think you have COVID-19 and rush off somewhere. If you've been exposed to someone that's traveled to China, you've been exposed, you've been to China yourself, um, then I think you should worry about it. Uh, without that, again, like uh, Dr. Kaiser said earlier, you know, what kid doesn't have a fever, a cough, and a runny nose in between the months of November and April in California? It's 100% of them. So if they're, if they're acting really, really sick, if they're acting short of breath, if they're acting, um, they're not playful, they're not interacting. Um, so the same reason why we would tell you if you have the flu that you should go get checked out would be the same reasons for this as well. One of the questions that we are facing on this campus, and I'm sure the other campus are, we've got many Chinese students here. Should they go home? If it comes up to break, summer break, something else, should they go home? Or is it better to stick on this side? Can they get back? Uh, obviously, that's going to be a question that, that will have to go with time. Any comments on that? So right, right now, if they went home, uh, they, wouldn't allow to become, they wouldn't be allowed to come right. back. So from their perspective, it's probably safer to stay here if they want to stay in school. Um, again, the risk of exposure should be significantly less here than it would be if they went home. Okay. And if they happen to travel to Hubei province, if that actually is home, and people, you know, this is a small area of China. Wuhan is the Chicago of China. It's 11 million people. Um, if they happen to go there and they come back, they are subject to the federal 14-day quarantine, and that was mandatory. Um, people need to be aware of that. There's a reason why there's a level three advisory. Watching the stock market yesterday and today, I sense that the economic impact of this may be greater than the health impact uh, with all the fear about uh, supply chain and all that sort of stuff. So that could be a huge issue on, on everybody's economy. Kelsey? What consideration should we make for pregnant women? Do we know the impact of COVID infection during pregnancy? So the answer to that is no, or we don't know. If you take the information we have for influenza and other illnesses, I think you need, we probably need to make an assumption that it's probably similar to that. So again, one of the reasons why we tell pregnant people to get uh, influenza vaccines is because it does potentially reduce the risk of how bad influenza that they get. Obviously, there is no uh, vaccine for COVID-19 right now. So again, the precautionary things that trying to prevent and, uh, and uh, trying to catch the disease is what they should concentrate and worry about. Another one? Should we limit our international travel to places other than China? Other than what's occurred on the list, no. Um, my, my wife is in Australia. I'd like to see her. Um, <laughs> so um, it, I, I think that people should keep well informed of what's on that list. Uh, South Korea came up really quickly in the news. Um, that's, pro that's the largest single country outside of China. That's probably going to hit 1,000 cases probably by tonight. Um, Italy shot up really quick, too. Only certain portions of Italy, and we're primarily talking about Lombardy in the north. Um, but these things change in a hurry. Uh, as it stands right now, travel to other places that are not under advisory are probably OK. Um, but make sure that you're, you're aware of what's going on. If you can get a refundable fare for not a lot of money, it might be a good time to exercise that. Influenza stresses capacity for the sickly at hospitals. Can you speak to potential triage issues if coronavirus becomes prevalent? Yeah, so there's not enough hospital beds in this country that if, if COVID-19 becomes really prevalent that we can actually handle it due to the isolation issues. CDC currently recommends that these patients go in negative pressure rooms. Each hospital in San Bernardino and Riverside County probably has somewhere between 8 and 10 of these rooms total. I have 85 um, in my county. Yeah. So that means I can take 85 patients. So from that perspective, yes, this will stress health care completely. Now, the good news is, again, most of these patients aren't sick. If you're not sick, you don't need to be in the hospital. And again, 
These two get to figure out where you get to go if you're not sick. We get, we get to figure out where you go if you are sick. Any comments, because I know one of the biggest issues in disease like this is how infective are you during the incubation period before you have any symptoms? The answer to that question is we don't know that either, but I can say this. From our, you know, the more, because we can pick up virus in people's um, uh, nasal and oral secretions, you can assume that if somebody is asymptomatic, there just isn't that much virus around, mm -hmm. because otherwise they're not sick. Um, the more you have, the more you're likely to shed it in body fluids, and then where you're more likely to be viremic, the more likely you are to pass it on. Um, there is a lot of concern over whether asymptomatic individuals can actually effectively spread COVID-19. Uh, COVID that is still an undetermined question. Uh, the German case that some of you have heard about where some, uh, supposedly somebody there was asymptomatic and spread it to three other people, well, they weren't totally asymptomatic. They were probably shedding some small amount. And this is a fairly communicable virus, so they may have been able to shed just enough in the right circumstance to get those people sick. Um, I don't think that they are a major contributor, but we're finding out things all the time. Um, the long and short of it is even if you don't have symptoms but you test positive, I'm going to treat you as if you're contagious. The real question is should we be testing on asymptomatic people? I'm going to let that one ride. Another one? What level of personal protective equipment other than the N95 mask should be used for direct patient care for suspected positive cases? So it's going to be the N95 mask and then general standard um, personal protective equipment. So gloves, mask, sorry, gloves and a gown. Um, and that's it. Why don't you explain the N95 mask and other masks and what is out there? So there's a couple different masks. The regular kind of surgical mask that people see, which is just a, a thin paper mask that, again, protects stuff from going out. The N95 mask is actually fitted, um, and you're supposed to, uh, and actually all employees at the hospital are fit tested on it to make sure that it actually seals properly so stuff doesn't go in. Um, and so there's, I think we have two different kinds of N95 masks here at uh, Loma Linda. Um, but you can also buy N95 masks at Lowe's and Home Depot and others, and it's what people use for painting. Um, however, those people have not had them, quote, fit tested, so you don't know for sure how well tight the seal is, everything like that. If you do have a mustache, a beard, or something like that, then these masks actually don't seal very well, and that would be you, Dr. <laughs> hmm. um, and so they actually don't work nearly as well. I have to just add that um, also a face shield, because there, there's some thought could be transmitted through the eyes as well. One other note about N95 masks, too, is, is that they're really hard to breathe in. Um, you know, I work with active tuberculosis patients as part of my job. Um, I wear an N95 mask. By the end of the visit, I'm like, can you give me a minute here? Because <laughs> uh, i got to take a second. These are really hard to, be, to breathe in. And if they're not on your face, they're not doing anything. Um, you know, well, during some of the wildfires, for example, we saw kids with N95 masks. I guarantee that kid ripped it off their face five minutes after that picture was taken which means it was presenting no uh, protection to them at all. Um, we are actually running into a situation in some areas where we have a shortage of appropriate N95 masks, so please um, help, help us deal with the community and, and reserve those for the situations where we're actually dealing with direct patient contact. Yeah, I think healthcare employees also need to understand that is, you know, save the N95 masks for when they're actually, <laughs> used, when they're actually needed, um, which is not all the time. Kelsey? How do we differentiate between a common, excuse me, between the common flu, cold, and, if, and the coronavirus if they have the same symptoms? I, sure, I think, it, as uh, Dr. Cotton mentioned, it just goes back to the exposure. I mean, the symptoms may be similar, but it just depends on if there's been any exposure to someone who could have the COVID-19. So the exposure becomes a real key issue, otherwise yes. it's just mm -hmm. flu symptoms. Because the, CDC, the CDC's case definition is essentially flu plus China. All right. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so the epidemiologic link is critical, otherwise you're dealing with the flu. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some more, Kelsey? If the COVID-19 virus develop into a pandemic, what will be the early signs that such will be the case? I think the first thing that you would see is that healthcare facilities start to become impacted. 
Um, and that's, you know, even though we believe that many people will go on to make a full recovery, that many people are also going to be ill, and they will present, and we'll start seeing numbers start increasing in our local facilities. We, in public health, we have something called syndromic surveillance. Um, syndromic surveillance is a network of, of basically sentinel sites which report in about what we're seeing in those areas. Um, are we seeing large amounts of traffic in our emergency departments? Are we seeing more uh, influenza-like illnesses that pop up? When we start seeing those numbers increase to the point where it now has becomes difficult for those facilities to function, then that's probably where we start ringing the alarm bells and we start to figure out who needs to be there, who does not need to be there, where can I put them, and how can I take care of them for that period of time. Mo as again, like we say, most people who go to an ED don't actually need to be admitted, but this could still be an issue for people who actually are in the ED who do need to be admitted and happen to be um, ill themselves. And after that, then you start to... Uh, you, you start talking about then where these people actually have to go. But I think it's our healthcare system that would be our canary in the coal mine. You see those numbers of, of cases increasing uh, to the point where we then start to have system-wide impacts. Um, that's, I think, where we start to realize that we're going to have to deal with this differently. Um, nobody wants to give up on this. You, there, the, when you, we start talking about the words pandemic, it seems like people have resigned themselves to the fate um, that coronavirus will somehow become embedded in our communities. That is still a possibility. Um, but by the same token, you know, this is my community, which I have a job to do in, to, in defending it, and I intend to do so. I know Dr. Gustafson does as well, and as Dr. Cotton pointed out, we're certainly to epidemic proportions in some areas, but we are not to a pandemic, not even in China, and I certainly know the Chinese, of all people, are the ones most interested in making sure that doesn't happen. Emergency departments become great big incubation centers for flu and other sorts of stuff, and that's why we've got a tent and other things to try to separate that for flu reasons. So, so more, Kelsey. Can, can you explain that anxiety is a normal feeling and how people can resolve it? <laughs> well, I think we'd all be rich if we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's natural when there's something that you don't know much about that you're nervous about what it could mean to you, um, uh, both individually and for your community. Um, and I think that's where, the, where people get the feelings of anxiety here is, is we don't know where it is, we don't know what it is, and we don't really know what we can do about it. Now, the good news in the last six weeks is we've learned more about it, um, but like we both said earlier, this is something we still know everything and nothing about. Um, if this does act um, as we expect, more like influenza and some of the coronaviruses that we know, we have less to worry about. And we think that's the way it's going to be, but we have to be prepared for if it goes the other way. Let me ask for the normal person in the community around in the Inland Empire. Let's, let's pick on the older folk like me. Uh, how do they best monitor exposure? Not like exposure, how do they best monitor information? I mean, is it news reports? Is it go on to the CDC website periodically? Or what's the best way to stay up to date on what should happen? I think as Dr. Cotton mentioned, this CDC has probably the best, uh, best information at this time. Is it specific enough that they'll help you in Inland Empire? It is. It is. Okay. And we also have great websites of our own um, that our, our public affairs guys slave over every day. Um, and we, that also gives you an idea of what's going around here. But Let's also bring out one of the things on the slide, too. I don't see it up there. But um, the actual risk to any individual in the Inland Empire right now is low. And it's probably going to remain that way for a while. Um, you know, this, as long as these mandatory quarantine periods remain in effect, even though the net is not 100%, the net is still pretty good. Um, people are being directed through, like, for example, our returning traveler was detected through the, that system. You know, the setup at the cruise ship, though, that'll be a epidemiologic study for years to come. But nevertheless, the system that they went through ensured that they did not return to the community and become a risk to that community. In that sense, the system function is designed. Let's give a couple of website addresses here. So Riverside is? Rivcoph.org. So R-I-V-C-O-P-H dot O-R-G. Yep. And San Bernardino? I'm sorry, I don't know right off. SBcounty.gov, I think, slash public health or something. I believe so. That's right. an emerging infection site as well. .gov slash SBK. And Adrian, do you, is there one here that you 
So cdc.gov is, again, the most reliable one. If you go to Loma Linda's uh, homepage, there's multiple links off there for, right. uh, and we actually link from there to uh, multiple other websites as well. Okay. Okay, Kelsey, let's take a couple more. We saw many photos from Wuhan with people putting masks and protective suits on their dogs and cats. Can COVID-19 actually be, tr be transmitted to dogs and cats? No. There are, there are veterinary coronaviruses. Um, your veterinarian will tell you about them. This one, no. Which is actually a, a point of interest because we had sort of a, a support animal in the quarantine area and we had to do a little bit of research to figure out whether it was safe to have this really gorgeous St. Bernard puppy in the premises. I mean, this was just a darling dog. I was like, I'm not too sure, um, but at the end of it, fine, whatever. Um, so the answer is no. Uh, if they're putting masks on their pets, those are some patient pets to keep them on. <laughs> and the masks are also useless because they will not get them to yeah, see they won't fit the facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. If this acts similar, excuse me, if this acts similarly to SARS-1, do you expect a seasonal dissipation? Quite possibly. Um, we, you know, we, there's a reason why we have a viral season because there's less ultraviolet light. Um, people are in closer quarters, easier for it to spread when it's colder. Uh, so the answer to this question is quite possibly um, uh, COVID-19 may end up having a seasonal pattern like other kinds of uh, viral diseases during the winter. The problem is it's February, it's still awful cold in China, and we have no idea if that's actually going to be true. Um, our hope is that it is because that would introduce a nice end to this, um, but uh, we have to be prepared for that possibility that doesn't happen. Let's take one more question, Kelsey. Is getting the flu vaccine helpful? For not for getting flu. the flu, yes. yes. For COVID-19, no. Although I'm telling people, go get the flu shot because if I line up with sick contacts, don't be in my dragnet, okay? <laughs> don't get sick in my jurisdiction, and I don't have to worry about you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, Dr. Gustafson, Dr. Cotton. I'm sure they'll be glad to stay by and answer any further questions if you have some. So thank you all for coming, and hopefully we don't see you at the hospital. <laughs>